Welcome to uh, the last class of CSE 102. We will be, by now you should have taken your quiz from the class before, and then at the end of this class we will give you the final exam for you to uh, work on, and you can, folks taking this class at home, you should take the final after you're all done and then send it in to us and we will grade that. We're going to finish some more things. Uh, we began last week about lies in the textbooks. We covered a little bit about Hitler and his philosophy, Mein Kampf, his book that he wrote, which means my struggle. And in this book, Hitler uh, shows his racism over and over and over and his strong belief in evolution. I have a doc covered in, or colored in many pages here. You can see Hitler's philosophy from his book. As I read it, it's, it's a boring book to read. I mean, the guy was a, a lousy writer, for one, unless they translated it wrong. It's, he's just, a, he wasn't too bright, I don't think. But he was really a motivator of people. Uh, so we're going to finish <clears throat> some more things, some lies in the textbooks that kids are exposed to every week. They go to school, they read these books, and they see things in there that have been proven wrong many, many years ago. And one of my hobbies is collecting public school textbooks. We're going to try to finish this section uh, today. I don't know if we can get through it all or not, but we'll work on it. Um, they're going to teach the kids that the appendix is vestigial. Now, this would be a quiz question. The word vestigial means you don't need it anymore. Uh, there are no vestigial organs, but they tell the kids the appendix is vestigial. Wrong side. That means you don't need it anymore because our appendix is smaller than the corresponding organ on a horse, for instance. Well, our ears are smaller than a horse's ears also, and probably our legs are smaller, and probably lots of things are smaller if you stop and thought about it. <laughs> it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean we're slowly losing it. We just don't eat as much of the roughage that they do, and you don't need that to filter out whatever the appendix does. The appendix is not vestigial. Even encyclopedias will tell you it is no longer thought to be a vestigial structure. It is where the immune responses are initiated. And people who take their appendix out have a much greater susceptibility to leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, cancer of the colon, and cancer of the ovaries. You do need your appendix. Now, it is true you can live without it. You can live without both your legs and both your eyes and both your arms also. It doesn't prove you don't need them. Okay? You do need those things. This uh, textbook tells the kids that the whale has a pelvis that is vestigial. It says, just imagine whales walking around. It's true. <laughs> this is a book for seven and eight-year-olds. Whales didn't walk around. They show the kids the little bones in the abdomen of the whale and say this is a vestigial pelvis to say you don't need it anymore. This one says uh, the whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. Well, that's just sheer baloney. You can see the little bones way in the back there. I'll blow them up for you. Right there are those little bones they're talking about. Those are not legs. <laughs> can you imagine moving a 50-ton animal? <laughs> go and go. You'd have to work awfully hard. They're not vestigial legs, okay? Uh, they never were. What those are, those little bones are places where muscles attach. And without those bones and those particular muscles, the whales cannot reproduce. You can't get any more baby whales without those muscles and those bones, so that's not vestigial. So any author that tells the kids the whale has a vestigial pelvis is either ignorant of his whale anatomy, and he shouldn't be writing a book about it, or he's a liar trying to promote a theory. Now, if you have some evidence for evolution, I would like to see it. I want to see it so badly, I'll give a quarter million dollars for it. There isn't any. All the stuff they show the kids in these books has been proven wrong. This one says, humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. Well, now, hold on a minute. You do need your tailbone, okay? There are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone. I've got Gray's Anatomy in there. You can come read it if you'd like. Those little muscles are essential for numerous different functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those little muscles and those bones. You need the tailbone. And uh, I tell him, look, if one, I was in a debate one, with one guy, and he said, uh, he said, I've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, sir, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that, that attach to the tailbone. Um, and if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. <laughs> it won't take but a few minutes and you will figure out, wow, that was a mistake. <laughs> we should not have done that. You do need your appendix and you do need your tailbone. There are no vestigial organs. Back when they started this concept of vestigial structures, they had 180 vestigial organs on the list. They said you don't need your tonsils, you don't need your adenoids, you don't need your pituitary gland, you don't need your... They had 180 things they said you don't need. Over the years, they slowly have diminished that down to none. I guess you need it all, okay? But they were so desperately looking for evidence for this dumb theory of evolution 
that they jumped on this vestigial structure idea. Now, think about the logic, though. Even if there were vestigial organs, there aren't any, but if there were, that's the opposite of evolution. Isn't that losing something, not gaining something? <laughs> now, how does that work? You lose everything until you have it all? I mean, you don't need to be too much of a genius to figure that out. That's not going to work very well. Now, if something is designed, it demands a designer. Somebody designed these glasses. Even though it's 100% natural materials, it, there's a designer involved. If you're walking along the beach and you see a pair of glasses laying in the sand, you automatically recognize them as designed. You do not recognize them as a natural product of the waves beating on the sand, because glass is made out of sand, you know. It's just obvious there's a designer involved. This is, as far as I know, the world's largest rock group, Mount Rushmore. If you know of a bigger one, let me know. Stone Mountain's pretty big, but I don't know if it's bigger than that or not. Um, do you think there's any way these four faces could have appeared on this rock by chance? Do you think the wind could have done that? Or the water erosion? Or maybe thermal expansion of the rock, you know, when it heats up, it expands? Or exfoliation, where pieces flake off automatically? No, I don't think so. Exfoliation, by the way, Eric, if you use that term in uh, earth science, you see that at the bottom of every uh, rock cliff, like uh, the one we climbed in uh, El Capitan El Capitan and Devil's Tower, there's a huge pile of broken off pieces. Every year, water gets up in the top in little tiny cracks. The sun will expand it and crack it. Water gets in and freezes, and pops off little flakes. Little pieces are constantly popping off every year, and they end up at the bottom in a big, huge pile. And that's called exfoliation. I don't know how to spell it. You can look it up. But uh, that's, <laughs> that's a process where this stuff is. So I always say, do you think wind or water or exfoliation or thermal expansion caused this? No. This was designed by a guy named Borglum. It took him years and years to build it. Design demands a designer. The evolutionists have never came up with an answer to that argument. They try awfully hard, but they've never been able to answer the simple question, if something is designed, why don't you think there's a designer? There had to be a designer. What they're doing now in the books, and it's pretty tragic that kids have to face this kind of stuff. Here's a um, 2000 textbook. They are being taught that things have adapted to their environment. That's the word you've got to watch now. They use that phrase, adapted. This one says, how are plants adapted to their environment? Then it says, the pitcher plant has adaptations to help it get nitrogen. <laughs> Why don't they say it was designed? Would you say your car door is adapted to let you into the car? I think somebody designed the car door to let you into the car, right? <laughs> it's not adapted. Um, this one says, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Why don't they say a design feature? Well, they don't want to use the word design because then some kid's going to say, who's the designer? They don't want to have to answer that question. Now think about this. If gills are adapted, if fish have adapted gills to live in the water, how did they live before they adapted the gills? You say, oh, they didn't live. None of them lived. For millions of years, they all died. <laughs> That's real brilliant, right? I always say, I'd like to have, I've had a few people, I'd love to throw them in the lake and keep them down there for a few million years. And see if sure, toss them in, see if they can adapt some gills real quick. <laughs> sure, I've met a few like that. When you have a complex structure like a watch, I have a Casio databank stopwatch. It holds 300 phone numbers. It uh, is a calculator. It's a stopwatch. It's an alarm clock. It's a countdown timer. It does not tell time. You have to look at it. But this is an amazing machine. This is made of 100% natural products. There's nothing supernatural about this. There is not a little man inside here running around changing the numbers on the face of the screen. <laughs> it's all, it all works by simple electronics and mathematics and chemistry and physics. There's nothing supernatural about this. However, this watch is more than just the components. It's more than just plastic and metal and you know copper wiring and silicone chips. It's intelligence. It's design. And your body is more than just chemicals. It is designed. It reflects intelligence, intelligent design. Um, Walter Brown's pretty real good. He says, evolutionists argue against design using arguments they designed. <laughs> Think about that one. That's pretty good. Uh, a great book to read on this topic would be Darwin's Black Box. Uh, Michael Behe is a, a biochemist, and he goes into the complexity of things. It's a fascinating way he wrote the book, too. 
He wrote it in, each chapter has two sections. Those who just want to get the simple idea is first, and then if you want all the details, the rest of that chapter is the go down deep, stay down long kind of stuff, where you can just skip that if you want and go to the, uh, to the next chapter. For instance, he takes an entire chapter describing the hair on a bacteria. A bacteria has a little hair on it that whips around and makes it swim through the water or through its little world. That hair has basically a rotary engine at the bottom that spins. That hair has 40, that, that rotary engine has at least 40 different parts to it. How many, what's the minimum number of parts to get an internal combustion engine to work? You have to have a piston, you have to have a connecting rod, a crankshaft, a wrist pin, something to hold the explosion, a head, valves to let it in, valves to let the exhaust out, a spark to set it off, some kind of electrical system. I would say if you took, look at a little tiny uh, remote control airplane engine, for instance, very small, very simple, one cylinder. doesn't even have the valves. It just has a port. Piston goes down, sucks gas in, squeezes it, throws it out, sucks in new gas. So you've eliminated the valves. Okay. What is the minimum number of parts you could get to have an internal combustion engine work? I don't know what it is, but it's probably around 100. Minimum number of parts. If you remove any one of those parts, it stops working. In uh, Behe's book, he talks about the mouse trap as an example. There are five parts that are required. If you take away one of those parts, it doesn't catch the mice. It doesn't work. And he challenges people, would you please try to um, design a mouse trap that has a spring, a hammer mechanism to hit the mouse, a latch mechanism to hold it back, a platform to nail it to, and staples to hold it down. He says this is called irreducible complexity. It has five parts. They all depend upon each other. You cannot take any one away without it ceasing to work. One atheist wrote him a letter and said, you're so dumb, I can reduce it to four parts. I can nail all those pieces to the floor. Well, duh, you just enlarged your platform is all you did. <laughs> you didn't take away the platform. <laughs> they get pretty desperate. The idea of complex things that you can't reduce it anymore, it just simply stops working. Now, how many parts on your car have to be there to make it work? Uh, lots, right? How many ha can you take away to make it stop working? Any one of many thousands of parts, like the key, right? The ignition, the oil, the gasoline. Uh, my dad, when he was in uh, Marines in World War II, he was in radar, and they would have to go into the islands after they took them from the Japanese, and they would set up radar bases. And one of the things they did for their training was, since this radar was operated by a diesel engine, their boss would sabotage their engine to make it stop working. And they had to see who could figure out what was wrong and fix it in the fastest amount of time. They would do all sorts of things to these engines. Of course, you pop off the distributor cap and run a pencil around the inside and put it back. Pencil lead is graphite, which conducts electricity, and the spark goes, goes to all cylinders all the time. Well, it doesn't run. He said the toughest one he ever had to find, they took a needle, took two spark plug wires that were touching each other, poked the needle through, and clipped it off and roughed up the rubber. So when it sent the spark to one, it sent it to two cylinders. And it ran terrible. And they, it took them a long time to figure out why. It was a little tiny needle stuck between two spark plug wires. And there are so many things you can do for cars. When people get married, you know, you run the coil wire up on through, the, it through the fabric of the seat and the driver's seat. You know, when they hit the keys, <laughs> they get 20,000 20, volts in the gluteus maximus. Uh, we better not teach you guys all that stuff. Anyway, um, when they let go of the key, though, it stops. <laughs> and they wonder, what, what's going on here? But this little, <coughs> excuse me, this little motor on this hair on this bacteria has at least 40 parts. If you take any one away, it stops working. So how did the individual parts evolve? And how did the bacteria know when it had 35 parts? Man, if I can just get five more, this thing's going to start working. <laughs> how did it know? There's no way it could know. It's irreducibly complex. By the way, that little bacteria motor is so tiny, 8 million of them, of these motors, would fit in the cross-section of a human hair. Take a hair, cut it, the circle, eight million of those motors would fit on there. 
pretty tiny. And it whips around 100,000 RPM. Does anything we have today do that? I mean, we can't. 100,000 RPM, I don't know. I'm sure there are some things we have, you know, Still jet engines, turbines, and stuff will go that fast. But like your uh, uh, Suzuki Katana 600 had what? Red line of 10,000? Twelve thousand RPM, eight or nine times faster, and this big, <laughs> and it goes around so efficiently, it moves its little bacteria through the water, the equivalent of a person swimming sixty miles an hour. Now you get a real serious problem, as an object gets smaller and smaller, the fluid that it swims in feels thicker and thicker to that object. It's almost like you swimming through peanut butter. 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour. One breath. One breath? Uh, I don't know about the breath part. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, if that little bacteria can swim 60 miles an hour through its little tiny world, which has extremely high, what's called viscosity. Viscosity would be a good uh, quiz question to ask. Uh, viscosity is the, the thickness of the water. If we had a long, tall uh, glass tube full of water and we drop a marble in, it would fall fairly fast. We could time it. Okay. If we take the same jar, fill it full of honey, drop in the marble, falls much slower. Honey is thicker than water. Alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, is thinner than water. We could drop the ball in a tube of alcohol and it would fall faster. That has, that's called the viscosity. They measure motor oils with the viscosity, 30 weight, 40 weight, 50 weight. You know, 90 weight for the rear end of the car is very thick, heavy oil. Um, so the, the, thickness the, the thickness of the liquid is called the viscosity. Um, there's probably a more technical term, the resistance to flow or the resistance to movement or something. But this little bacteria has to overcome incredible viscosity problems. And he moves. I mean, I swam a mile one time in Boy Scouts in about 30 minutes. What's that? How many miles per hour is that? Uh, two miles per hour. <laughs> He's swimming 60 miles per hour. We need to sign them up for the Olympics. Um, and yet the textbook says, <coughs> we evolve from bacteria. Well, they're lots better off than we are. We're getting worse, not better. Charlie Darwin said in his book, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. Absurd. This is crazy. How can this happen? Even Darwin recognized this is a crazy idea. Because the eyeball is so complicated. And you go back again to the idea that design demands a designer. Charles Darwin said to many folks, you know, the eyeball confuses me more than anything. He said, I think this will be the undoing of my theory. This will be what proves my theory wrong. Well, there's a lot of things that prove your theory wrong, Charlie. Common sense will prove your theory wrong. But uh, this textbook says, the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Why doesn't God get the glory for what he made? Why do we all have to pay for the kids to be taught that eyeballs evolved when there's no possible way it can be happened and there's no evidence that it happened? So how they, what are they going to do to the kids in this textbook? What they're going to do, they're going to arrange eyeballs of different types of animals in some kind of order from what they think is simple to what they think is complex. Some eye spots on different creatures only sense light. They're just a little sensitive patch. It just tells if it's light or dark. That's all they can tell. Okay. Some have extremely uh, good vision, like the eagle can read the newspaper at the other end of the football field, if he could read and he cared what's going on. Uh, but he has incredible vision. So they have arranged these eyeballs in order, and look what they tell the kids right here. You can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you can picture, if you picture a series of changes during the evolution of the eye. In other words, you have to imagine it. See, boys and girls, we'll arrange them in order. Can't you imagine how it could happen? Evolution only takes place in the imagination. Never takes place in reality. You have to imagine how it might have happened. The Bible says very clearly, God formed the eye. Psalm 94. I think God ought to get the glory. Did you know on the back of your eyeball is what's called the retina, the backside that receives the light. That retina has 137 million light-sensitive cells in one square inch. Uh, how, would you like, how would you like to be the electrician to wire up 137 million connections in one square inch? Remember the boxes we wired up for the duplication system? You know, trying to get in there, little wires together. I remember as a kid, my dad got me a kit to build a ham radio. 
you know, short wave radio to transmit as a transmitter. And boy, all those little connections in there, and now they've miniaturized it much smaller. But even the fastest computer in the world, you get these big computers that have all these little microchips with these zillions of little tiny connections inside. The eyeballs got them beat by a long shot. And they think it happened by chance. If you think about the human eye that can not only, it can focus very quickly on different objects. I mean, what if you had a camera that could focus that quickly from one object to another? This camera can Andrew has back here is automatic focus. But if I stuck something up in front of the camera six inches away right now, it would take a fraction of a second to focus. Yet your eye can do it almost instantly. It adjusts for colors, more colors than any camera can ever pick up. Your eye can tell. You can hold up two different, or 20 different colors of white. I mean, go to the store and see how many colors of blue and white there are. How many shades of these colors. And your eye can see all this, more than any camera can see. And it, it adjusts for light, you know, the light intensity automatically, just bang, instantly. But it's pretty amazing the way it was designed. The uh, one atheist wrote me a letter and said, Oh, no, he called me. I was, on the, I was sitting in the office. He called. He said, Hovind, you're so stupid. I don't know how you can believe in creation. I said, what's my other choice? He said, evolution. I said, what makes you believe in evolution? He said, well, the human eyeball is designed backwards. He said, it's, no, he said it's built backwards. It can't have been designed. I said, what are you talking about? He said, the light comes into your eye, and it has to go, there's a layer of blood vessels in front of the retina. You can see the blood vessels on the top there. The light goes through those blood vessels before it strikes the retina, which allows you to see what you're looking at. I said, yeah, I knew about that. I taught biology. He said, well, those blood vessels block out some of the light. I said, yeah. He said, well, that's a poor design. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. Now, he's right. Octopus blood vessels are behind the retina. Human blood vessels are in front of the retina. He's absolutely right. And he says that proves that we're, neither one are designed because it's backwards. I said, well, sir, listen, let me explain something to you. Uh, we live in the air. Air does not stop UV light very well, ultraviolet light. UV light will burn your retina. That's why you don't shine lasers in kids' eyes. That's why you don't stand there and stare at the sun for 30 minutes. The UV light will burn your retina. I said, octopus live in the water. Now, water stops ultraviolet light. That's why as you go deeper and deeper, the water seems to change colors. Only the blue light penetrates. Different frequencies won't penetrate at different depths. As you go down, it changes color until pretty soon, of course, black. Real deep, only the very, very dark blue light will penetrate. Octopus live way down deep. They don't need the blood vessels in front. They're not getting any UV light. So they're designed for the water, and we're designed for the air, because blood vessels block out UV light. I said, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you go ahead, but you'll be blind in a few days. I said, do you have any other dumb questions? He said, no, that was it. No, click. <laughs> I get that all the time. I try to be nice to him, but it's, you know, it, it'd be hard living being that dumb, you know? It, it is, anyway, uh, what they're saying is, you know, God wouldn't have done it this way, so it must have evolved. Well, maybe you just don't understand why God did it that way. Maybe that's your problem, okay? And even if that, you know, that'd be a lousy argument for evolution. Okay, I want to spend a little time on this one, the origin of life, because just about every biology textbook that I have seen talks about how life got started. First, they'll have a chapter on biogenesis, how that life only comes from life. Yeah, I saw that in the new Prentice Hall series about, yeah, life only comes from life. Then in the next chapter, they'll say, well, let's try how life started from non-life. <laughs> Just totally, says, totally contradictory. No, of course not. They said Earth's atmosphere was different back then. And they talk about how it, they, they don't think it had oxygen in it. Right. We'll get into that in just a minute. All right. What happened in 1950s, a guy named Yuri and Miller, his uh, a student assistant, I forget which one was the student, Stanley Miller and uh, Harold Yuri. I think Stanley Miller was the student and Yuri was the teacher. Maybe I got him backwards. It doesn't matter. Anyway. He, was, he wanted to know how the Earth and solar system had come to be. Well, I could have told him that. I mean, it's right there in the Bible. But uh, <clears throat> he studied what he called Earth's primitive atmosphere. Now, right here is a major problem. They all assume that Earth did not have oxygen, like you said in the New Prentice Hall series they've got. 
that is simply not true. Earth's, Earth has always had oxygen. Even if the dumb geologic column were true, the oldest layers of Earth, the ones on the bottom, are highly oxidized. You know, when you drive through Georgia, the ground's all red. That's oxidation. That's iron ore in the, in the dirt. Iron, when it rusts, turns kind of a reddish color, iron oxide. Well, the oldest layers, by their twisted thinking, are still filled with iron oxide. Actually, more than we have today. <clears throat> Probably 30% oxygen. Today, we only have 20%. Well, so this, bus this business of Earth's primitive atmosphere is baloney to begin with. But what he did is he took these gases that he thought were in Earth's primitive atmosphere, and he mixed them together in his experiment. This textbook says, uh, Swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Oh, it's totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. Never happens. Um, this author said in uh, Encyclopedia, he said, Origin of species not addressed in 1859 and is still a mystery in 1998. Both the origin of life and the origin of major groups of animals remains unknown. How did life get started anyway? Well, what he did, he took these glass tubes and flasks and stuff, and he circulated gases through all these things. And he had a spark that would go off in this chamber. The spark was supposed to simulate lightning strikes. And he says, see, if you had the earth full of this kind of atmosphere and lightning kept striking, it would supply the energy to unite these molecules. Well, let's just look at this now. Um, what he did, oh, hang on a second. Pass through a little bit. Here, here's his picture, picture of what he did right here from Glencoe Biology, which I have uh, on the floor right there. He took methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen. No oxygen. He didn't want any oxygen in there because then you have what's called, there are two kinds of atmospheres. Oxidizing, which is what we're breathing right now, and oxygen will oxidize a lot of things. Cut an apple open, set it out for an hour, it'll oxidize and turn brown. Fruits, bananas, you know, it'll, it'll turn brown. That's called oxidizing. Uh, metal, if it's not protected, will oxidize. It'll rust. It attach, oxygen attaches to it. He didn't want any oxygen in here because he knew life forms might oxidize. That was his, his thinking on this. So he excluded oxygen. He said, it, this textbook says, he got a mixture that was rich in amino acids. That's what this textbook says. Now just hold on a second. Let's just discuss this for a minute. A letter of the alphabet would be called a building block to make a word, right? Each of these is called a letter of the alphabet, and you put them together to make words. If I gave you a box full of letters of the alphabet, millions of them, and you dumped them on the floor, what is the probability of them arranging themselves to make a word? Pretty small, right? What is the probability of them arranging themselves to make a sentence, even a simple sentence? The cat in the hat. What? Next, Next to none. That's not going to happen. Okay. A letter of the alphabet is like an amino acid. It takes a whole bunch of these put together just right Oh, one M. I taught science, not spelling, okay? Amino acid. It takes a whole bunch of these to make a sentence. A bunch of amino acids in the right order will make what is called a protein. So you have to have a bunch of amino acids in the proper order to make a protein. Now you've got to have millions of proteins to make a cell. That's kind of the stages. This is like a letter of the alphabet. This is like a paragraph. And this is like a book. He was able to make a few amino acids. Oh, that's good. And they jumped to the conclusion, wow, he made life. Well, how far is a letter of the alphabet away from a, a book in complexity? Long ways, right? The this, uh, this substance was not rich in amino acids. Here's what he did. He didn't come close to making life. He excluded oxygen because he knew life cannot evolve with oxygen present. It would oxidize whatever he made. And see, amino acids in the presence of oxygen... Oh. 
Amino acids in the presence of oxygen will oxidize. They begin to break apart. So he didn't want any oxygen there. But there's a problem with this. Um, Earth's atmosphere has always had oxygen, and you have to have oxygen to, to create ozone, and ozone is what stops ultraviolet light. And UV light destroys ammonia. And ammonia was one of the gases he used. So if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, which means your ammonia gets destroyed, so now your experiment's back to zero. You're taking away one of your four building blocks in this thing. And which means life cannot evolve without oxygen. So it looks to me like you have a little problem. If life cannot evolve with oxygen and it cannot evolve without oxygen, it cannot evolve, which is what I've been saying all along. <laughs> it can't evolve, period. So it, you can see Michael Denton's book on page 262. He shows the evidence that Earth's, Earth has always had oxygen, even more than today. Well, what he did, though, when he circulated this gas through this cell system, the spark combined some of the gases and made amino acids. Oh, very good. It went to the bottom, and he had a special trap that would make it fall out. He didn't want it to go through again because the same spark was about 100,000 times more likely to take it apart than it was to put it together. So he filtered out the product. That's not realistic. What he actually made was 85% tar and 13% carboxylic acid. Now, both of those are toxic to life. I don't make my students memorize a lot of numbers, but I do want you to know this for the quiz. What was the result of Miller's experiment as he tried to create life? He got 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. We'll just have the percentage for him to fill in, Marlissa. What percentage of carboxylic acid did he get? What percentage of tar? Just the numbers I want you to know. Let's see. 85 and 13 totals 98% poisonous substance. Poison. 2% amino acids. Now, there's some real problems here that students are not taught, and they ought to be taught. I mean, if you're really trying to teach biology, then let's teach the facts. He did not create life in the laboratory. He made the problem much worse. He demonstrated all we can get is a substance 98% poisonous to life. Now, there are 20 different amino acids. How many letters of the alphabet are there? 26. In the Russian alphabet, 30. 32 letters of the alphabet. How many different words can you make in Russian from those letters? Millions, probably. Well, hundreds of thousands of words, right? Uh, in English, 26 letters can be arranged to make hundreds of thousands of words. How many different ways can words be arranged in books? Unlimited. Infinite number. There is no limit. Amino acids, there's only 20 of them, like letters of the alphabet. You will need to know that. That'll be a quiz question. How many amino acids are there? They combine to make proteins. The smallest known protein has 70 amino acids. This is the smallest known protein with 70 amino acids. Think of a paragraph that has 70 letters in it. Uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Okay, that sentence contains all the letters of the English alphabet. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And that probably only has about 40, 50 letters. Okay? If I gave you a box full of all the letters of the alphabet, I told you I want you to dump them on the floor until you get that sentence, just by random chance. You'll never get it, will you? The problem really gets compounded when you figure the fact that letters of the alphabet have to be facing the right way. Amino acids are right-handed and left-handed. It's called chirality. You cannot put your right hand into a left glove. They look very similar. It's called a mirror image, though. It won't fit. These amino acids are mirror images of each other. Some right-handed, some left-handed. That's what he got. That won't work to create life, though. We'll show you that right after the break. Let's take a little break here, and we'll show you more about uh, making life in the laboratory. No, he did not make life. Didn't even get close. Coming up after the break. Let's finish up this uh, with this subject of making life in the laboratory. What he was able to make was 
2% amino acids, half of them were right-handed, half were left-handed. It's like a, a left-handed uh, bolt and a right-handed, right and left-handed nuts and bolts, you know. You, you just can't put them together. The threads go the wrong way. Or right-handed gloves and on, go on your left hand. This is called the chirality. C-H-I-R-A-L-I-T-Y, I believe is the spelling. Chirality means the spin or the twist of the, of the molecule. Each one is twisted a little bit. And in order for them to fit, it has to be all the same kind. Only right-handed ones will link together to make a chain, or only left-handed ones. But you cannot mix them. Now, if you drop letters of the alphabet on the floor, half of them will be upside down backwards. Now in, in America, if your letter R lands upside down, you cannot use it. In Russia you can use it, right? <laughs> but not in America. Uh, and so some of the letters are okay if they're upside down. T, no problem. A, no problem. C, ah, this is problem. This cannot be backwards. This is not a letter of the alphabet. Okay? So he ended up with half right-handed, half left-handed. Now the problem with this is um, the smallest proteins have 70 to 100 of these amino acids in a precise order and all left-handed. The DNA or the RNA molecules in your body are all right-handed. What are nucleotides? The uh, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, the small parts inside the nucleus of the cell. There's a zillion different parts. I've got a book I want you to look at just on the cell. One cell is more complex than the city of New York. To supply New York City, how many things come in, how many things go out, how much uh, movement is there within the city to keep things running smoothly? Unbelievable, right? One cell is more complicated than that. Stuff comes in, moves around within the cell, has to be transported back and forth. The book, uh, Darwin's Black Box, deals with that subject very well. That's an excellent book to read. Okay, so here Michael, or Miller and Yuri have a problem. They have several problems. They excluded oxygen, which won't work. They trapped out the product so it wouldn't go through again, which des destroys the whole experiment. And half what he made was right-handed, half was left-handed. These are at least three of the problems with his experiment. Um, and hundreds of amino acids must be made. And amino acids must combine to, call, to form a protein. And proteins, when they're in water, will come apart faster than they go together. They're more likely to dissolve than they are to bond together. And most people have recognized that the oceans are completely full of water. No doubt, no doubt about it, all the way to the bottom. <laughs> and. He wanted this thing to take place in the oceans with lightning striking. Well, you got a problem because your little molecules, once you get four or five of them to combine, they break apart. And you got to get a hundred of them to make one protein, and then you got to get a bunch of proteins to make a cell. And then who's this cell going to marry? There's some real serious problems here. Um, Brownian motion is named after a guy named Brownian. If you take a glass of water and put in one drop of red food coloring, very gently set the drop in there, what will happen eventually? It'll spread out. That's called Brownian motion. One drop of perfume in this room, the Brownian motion is the molecules are bumping into each other. And just because all the molecules are bumping, it'll gradually spread it out. So Brownian motion is going to drive his amino acids away from each other. It's not going to put them together. You would have to get so many of these amino acids in this ocean to get them to even find each other. It's not going to happen. Um, there's a couple of good websites about this that deal with this topic, but they somehow get this idea, you know, if we just get all the molecules together and add energy, it'll make life. I say, okay, well, let's do an experiment. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. In a few minutes you will have frog nog <laughs> and you will have all of the molecules required to make a frog in one place. Now we're going to add energy to this blender. We're going to hook it up to a turbine engine and run it 40 zillion RPM. 
We're going to nuke it and microwave it and hook up jumper cables and zap it. Anything you want to do, I don't care. You do anything you want. How long will it take to reassemble the frog? Wow. Never going to happen, is it? Millions and millions of years. Yeah, even if you get it together, he's dead. Good point. There's a lot of frogs out there that are, that are dead. dead. Yeah, on the highway. Yeah. About this big and about this thick. Right? <laughs> um, so somehow, there, there's more to life than just the arrangement of the molecules. You know, an airplane is made up of millions of parts that cannot fly. None of the parts can fly. You put them all together, and it takes intelligence to do this, and then it can fly. The airplane does not fly because of what's inherent in the parts. There's nothing in aluminum that makes it fly. It's designed. And there's nothing in the molecules of the frog that makes it alive. It, there's a breath of life in there that nobody understands. Then they arrange them in order of how they think it happened. So getting from non-living material up to the first cell could not possibly have happened. Zero chance. Didn't happen. It's impossible. But they think it did. Okay. Now you have another serious problem because you have to increase the complexity of this life. It's interesting, in, in the world today we have zillions of one-celled creatures. They only have one cell. Then you have a few things that get together with colonies of cells, maybe 20 cells attached to each other, to work to, to they call it a colony of cells, a growth of these cells, 20. Why are there no two-celled living organisms anywhere in the world? It's either one or 20. And even 20 is not really a tissue. It's just a colony. It's a group living together. The next step beyond that would be a tissue which contains probably hundreds of thousands of cells. So where are the intermediates? Why, aren't there, no, why are there no two-celled organisms? I ask this to evolutionists all the time. And they'll say, well, they must have existed, but there are no longer any left. Well, how come the one-celled ones survived and the two-celled ones didn't? We've got lots of one-celled ones today. Why don't we find any fossils of two-celled organisms? Or three-celled, or four-celled? Where are they? They didn't exist, folks. It just didn't happen. Um, but the poor kids are going to be taught that it did. Gonna be, okay, good, it happened, and you better believe this. They teach that bacteria are simple life forms. Now, they're not, okay? And they slowly evolve to humans, which they say are very complex life forms. There's no such thing as a simple life form. But they arrange them in these trees, and it's just pure nonsense. Even people like Mary Leakey, Richard Leakey and Mary Leakey, the whole Leakey family, <coughs> good, good name for them, uh, <laughs> they spend all their time over at Africa digging around in the dirt looking for bones. Now, if you spent your lifetime digging in the dirt looking for bones, when you found one, you would want everybody to think it's important so they didn't think you were dumb for spending your lifetime digging in the dirt looking for bones. So they try to make a big deal out of this bone that they found in the dirt. And they will say it's the ancestor of all humans or something like that. And they've spent a lot of time digging in the dirt over there and moved, dug, up a lot of, dug up a lot of bones and dug up a lot of dirt too. Um, but they will say that these trees of life that are in our textbooks are just nonsense. Well, there's no evidence of this, one animal evolving to another kind of animal. Stephen Gould is the Marxist, communist, socialist professor at Harvard University. He said, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are, are, have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. That means we infer. We think it happened. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. What they do is they arrange these trees... All we see is the tips of the branches. The rest of the tree is imagination. They think it happened. They infer that it happened. Now this text, it looks to me like this Heath biology book is trying to tell the kids that the humans, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. Is that what you get out of that? How many get that? You see that? Okay, that's what they're teaching, right? Everything inside that outer circle is imagination. Nobody's ever seen any animal produce a different kind of animal. It's never been observed. Um, and, of course, that teaching will destroy the faith of children who believe that. And it's sad that so many kids go to school and they're taught this kind of stuff and they end up going home with their faith in the Scriptures destroyed because of a book that you and I paid for. Uh, Miller Levine, one of the worst as far as teaching evolution, 
Uh, every year it changes. And it's having a race. Who can be the worst? You know, <laughs> they, they had the worst one time. Uh, this one, Glencoe Biology 94 edition, says all the many forms of life on Earth today are descended from a common ancestor. That's, of course, somebody's imagination. He says this is found in a population of, now watch this, primitive unicellular organisms. Unicellular means single cell. One cell, organism. Well, one cell is made up of thousands and thousands of proteins. It's more complex than New York City. Each of those proteins is made up of hundreds of amino acids. They were able in the laboratory to produce a few amino acids, half right-handed, half left-handed, but only by making up an atmosphere that never existed on Earth. Didn't happen. Um, what is a primitive unicellular organism, anyway? There is no such thing. They somehow think that because it is smaller, therefore it is simple. Now, the problem is, back in the 1850s and 60s, Darwin and many people in that day believed that the cell was just a little glob of plasma. They thought it was like a little bag of jelly. That's all it is. They, could, they just had microscopes that could see the cells, but they couldn't see anything inside them. They couldn't tell much about them. They just thought, oh, it's a little glob of jelly, and your body's made up of millions of these all stuck together. So they thought the cell was a simple little bag of jelly. The more we've studied the cell now in the last hundred years, the more we've realized it is unbelievably complex. And the deeper you get into it, the more you realize each of the parts that are in there are incredibly complex. It's like you're walking into a, a shop full of tools. All of those tools is designed to do something. And you look at each tool, and it has a bunch of parts to it. Okay. Incredibly complex. A paramecium is a single-celled organism. You can put thousands of these into one drop of water. Real tiny. But each one is more complex than a space shuttle. Smaller is not simpler. Here's a microchip inside a paperclip. Pretty small microchip. This ant is holding a microchip. That little microchip can process every letter of the Bible 200 times in one second. 200 times per second through the entire Bible. I think the Bible has like three quarters of a million words. I don't remember how many letters. 31,000 verses or something like that. And it can go through every letter 200 times in one second. That chip is pretty small, wouldn't you say? Smaller is not simpler. Smaller is more complex. I, like, I use the illustration of comparing the Cray computer. Now, there's now a faster computer than the YPMC90, but at the time, the YPMC90 was Cray's fastest computer. Um, the Cray computer is huge. The brain of a honeybee is very tiny. The Cray computer does 6 billion calculations per second. They now have them faster than that. Um, the honeybee's brain is estimated to do a thousand billion calculations per second. Now think about what's going on in that honeybee's brain. He's flying along. That little tiny brain is keeping his heart beating, right? Keeping oxygen flowing through his body. How complicated is it to fly? He has to control the wings. Every muscle that attaches to his wings has to be told to contract. Relax, contract, relax, thousands of times. And if you want to turn left, if you want to turn left, you have to tilt the wings. Ask any pilot, you know, go sit in an airplane sometime. See how complicated it is to fly. That little brain is controlling all of that. At the same time, it is keeping track of every cell in his body to decide which one needs more oxygen. Am I getting too hot? Do I need to open up you know, to let some of the heat off? Like your body, you sweat when you get hot, you shiver when you get cold. Your body is controlling all that automatically. You don't think about it. It just does it automatically. At the same time, that bee is digesting the food that he ate. His brain is controlling that. And he's navigating by the magnetic field of the Earth. And he's figuring out where to go find some nectar to make some honey to go back to the hive. Right. And they take the hive, I've heard people say, that raise bees. The bee can fly around, and they're so precise in their navigation. They will fly out to the flower, bzzz, get the nectar, 
fly back. On the way back, the beekeeper will move the hive over one inch. They will come and bump into where the hole used to be. Bang! Take them a minute to figure out, oh, the hole's over here, <laughs> and move over. I saw one, uh, this guy took a, a wasp. This wasp had stung a grasshopper and killed it, and he was dragging it back to the hole to put in the ground for it to feed the kids. The, the wasp is programmed to check the hole to make sure nobody went in there while I was gone. He sets the grasshopper down, he walks over, looks in the hole, comes back to get the grasshopper and drags it down in. Well, this guy was sitting there watching this, and he got a tweezers, and when the wasp went over to check the hole, he moved the grasshopper. The wasp found the grasshopper, dragged it back next to the hole, turned around, checked the hole again, went back to get the grasshopper, but he moved it again. Something in his little brain tells him, I have to check, I have to park the grasshopper this far away and then check the hole. He did it 40 times. The wasp never figured out, it's okay, the hole's fine, okay, no, nobody's, in, nobody's in there. <laughs> hey, finally the guy said, well, forget it, let him take the grasshopper. So after 40 times, he never did figure it out. Now, you figure how small this honeybee's brain is, and estimates are it's doing a hundred, I'm sorry, a thousand billion calculations every second. Much faster than a Cray computer. The Cray computer uses lots of energy. Huge power lines feed that thing. One of the measures of a computer is how efficient they run. The honeybee uses 10 microwatts, which is very little electricity. The honeybee can fly a million miles on one gallon of honey. I had a Toyota one time that got 44 miles to the gallon. I thought, wow, this is awesome. That was pretty good. They have Shell Oil Company, I believe, sponsors a competition to see who can get the best gas mileage out of their car. I read one year where some guy got 1,078 miles per gallon. He took his uh, car, took out all the windows so it'd have no resistance to wind flow or less resistance. He put airplane tires on there, pumped them up to 150 pounds of pressure, and then shaved them with a razor to make them as smooth and hard as possible. Little friction. Had a one-cylinder engine with a real long stroke. <laughs> One cylinder, real long piston and crankshaft. 1,078 miles to the gallon. He only went five miles an hour. That is, the record now is probably like 1,600 miles per gallon. That's pretty good. Honeybee gets a million miles per gallon. And if you study the size of the honeybee compared to his wing size, he can't fly. But don't tell the bee that. He's doing pretty good, okay, without knowing, without that bit of information. Um, the cost of a Cray computer used to be $48 million. The br honeybee's brain is pretty cheap, okay? Uh, you splat them on your windshield all the time. Many people have to take care of the Cray computer. There's a whole room full of people just to babysit that machine. Nobody helps the honeybee. Here he is flying around with the most complicated computer in the world in his head, at least much more complicated than a Cray, and he just flies around and does himself and reproduces himself. Absolutely unbelievable that this stuff happens. The Cray used to weigh 2,300 pounds. I think they've got a way to cut that weight down now. But still, the honeybee's brain doesn't weigh very much. The computer is huge, slow, inefficient, costs a lot of money. You've got to babysit the dumb thing. And there's nobody with half a brain who would say the Cray computer happened from an explosion in an electronics factory. But these same guys turn right around and tell us the honeybee evolved. And the human brain is much more complicated than a honeybee's brain. The human brain is millions of times more complex than a honeybee. Did you know your brain weighs about three pounds? And there are more connections between the cells in your brain. Each brain cell is connected to a bunch of other brain cells. There are more connections in your brain than there are electrical connections in the entire world. How many wires have been hooked together? How many wires have you hooked together in your lifetime? Quite a few, right? Either solder them or crimp them or twist a wire nut on them. That's called a wire connection. All of the connections, including all the little connections, how many are in a computer? You got this machine comes down, makes 100 connections at once, you know, in a computer circuit board. Figure all the connections in the world. Your brain has more than that. What is this chart for? This shows on the bottom is the memory capacity. How much information can it store? 
For instance, the British Library is a huge library. It has a lot of information stored in there. Your brain is about the same. Maybe not yours. The average brain is <laughs> the average brain has more information than uh, the same information as the British Library, for instance. Now, uh, going up the chart on the other side is the computational power. How many bits per second can it process? The British Library has a lot of information, but you couldn't get it all out of there very quickly. How long would it take you to read all those books? Long time. Okay. The human, the elephant, and the whale are up at the top of the chart, way past the Cray computer. Yes, <laughs> one and one, right. Um, and yet they think this evolved. I, I look, I, I admire their faith, okay, but it's, 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 it's ill-founded, okay. One professor told me, we were in this debate one time, and I said, sir, do you believe your brain is just three pounds of chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years? He said, yes, I do. I said, well, tell me, sir, how can you trust your thoughts? And the conclusions you come to. Maybe you've got a chemical in there backwards. Yeah, he did, by the way. <laughs> Human brain is unbelievably complex. Um, okay, DNA, we'll get into that next time. We'll take up our next class with DNA starting in... CSE 103, and then hopefully we'll get into part 5, which is the politically incorrect part on the effects of teaching evolution. Communism, socialism, Marxism, we'll get into all that when we start up CSE 103. Okay, Marlissa, make a note. We're going to quit right there on starting with DNA for the next class. Thank you so much for, so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this uh, information.